So Saraswati has been, been explaining what happens at the point of death and I don't think it's been particularly useful because it's, it's basically just trying to justify a particular notion which I think we could safely say is part of the Hindu way of looking at things and uh, part of that notion was that there's actually we could actually impose a moral order on all living things and those that are born in a certain model or a certain circumstance uh, particularly affluent circumstances are somehow morally superior to those born in a in, in less fortunate circumstances so it's a bit of a low point of the yoga vasista but I, I think it then it, it then balances itself and talks about how how all that is just the all that is just a notion with no with no re, with no solid reality Sarasvati continued when that intelligence which is part of the infinite consciousness fancied itself to be a tree it became a tree or a rock it became a rock or grass it became grass there is no distinction between the sentient and the insentient, between inert and intelligent. There is, no, there is no difference at all in the essence of substances, for the infinite consciousness is present everywhere equally. The differences are only due to the intelligence identifying itself as different substances. The same infinite consciousness is known by different names in these different substances. In the same way it is the same infinite consciousness that the intelligence identifies as the worms, ants and birds. In it there is no comparison nor a sense of difference. Just as the people living in the North Pole do not know and therefore do not contra contrast themselves with the people of the South Pole. Each independent substance identified as such by this intelligence exists by itself <clears throat> without distinction from the other substances <coughs> ascribing distinctions to them as sentient and insentient is like a frog born in a rock and a frog born outside it considering themselves different one insentient and the other in and the other sentient <coughs> the intelligence which is a part of the infinite consciousness is everywhere and it is everything Whatever that intelligence thought of as itself, it became that in the very beginning of creation, and so it has remained ever since. It thought of itself as space, it thought of itself as the moving air, it thought of itself as the insentient, it thought of itself as the sentient beings. All this is nothing but the fancy of that intelligence. Such appearance is not the reality, though it appears to be real. So that's the bottom line. There's no ultimate distinction. Um, the cognitive process makes these distinctions. It divides things into sentient and insentient. Um, it, 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 it looks at experience. It takes experience and divides it into um, perceiver and what is being perceived. And then makes further classifications. <coughs> So after that little discourse on the um, the uh, of, on what happens after, at the point of death and beyond, we get back to our story. And in the story, King Vidurata has died, and he seems to be going back to the body of his previous incarnation, King Padma. O oh, Lila, I think that now the King Vidurata wishes to enter into the heart of the body of King Padma. He is proceeding towards it. The body of King Padma is lying in state. The enlightened leader said, O oh Goddess, let us also proceed in the same direction. Sarasvati said, Tuning himself to the ego principle in the heart of Padma, Vidurata fancies that he is proceeding to another world. Let us proceed along our own paths, one cannot tread the path of another. <coughs> so 
the sister continued. In the meantime, the life breath left the body of the king Vidurita, even as birds abandon a tree that is about to fall. His intelligence rose into space in an ethereal form. Leela and Sarasvati saw this and followed it. In a few moments, that ethereal form became conscious when the period of post-mortem unconsciousness came to an end. And the king fancied that he saw even the gross form which had been put together by the funeral rites performed by his relatives. With this he travelled towards the south and reached the abode of the god of death, who declared that the king had not committed any sinful action at all, and ordered his messengers to let him enter his own previous body of Padma, which lay embalmed. Instantly the jiva of Vidurata crossed over to the other universe in which Padma's body lay and reached the palace. Obviously Vidurata had been linked with Padma's body through the ego sense of the latter, even as a man travelling in distant countries is still attached to the place where he has buried his treasure. Rama asked, O holy sir, if one's relatives fail to perform the funeral rites properly, then how can that one obtain the ethereal form. And this, this refers to an ancient tradition, not just in, in Indian tradition, but um, even the, the, the pharaohs of the ancient Egyptian tradition would have done this. You perform funeral rites to assist the departed spirit on its way. And uh, so Ram was concerned about what happens if these rites aren't performed. The sister answered, whether the funeral rites have been duly performed or not, if the departed one believes that they've been performed, he gets the benefit of the ethereal form. <coughs> this, this is a well-known truth. Whatever be one's consciousness, that one is. Things, objects or substances, come into being on account of one's fancy. That's a thought or an idea. And once fancy also arises from the things. This is a bit like being in a dream. You can say it's all your fancy. You might not be conscious that you're fancying it, but it comes, some part of you has the notion of creating certain images and certain dreams. And then your fancy uh, changes according to what happens with these, with these images. Poison turns into nectar through one's fancy or faith. Even so, an unreal object or substance becomes real when such intense faith is present. I think this happens even sometimes. It used to, hap used to happen with, more often with the ancient people. When you believe in a, a god, it wouldn't be uncommon to actually see that god walking around. And you get it nowadays, I suppose, with people having visions of Jesus or the Virgin Mary and uh, um, you, at, least in the, at least in the Christian tradition. Without a cause, no effect is produced anywhere at any time and therefore there is no fancy or thought either. Hence, but for the one causeless infinite consciousness, nothing whatsoever has ever arisen or been created. Rest assured of this. If the funeral rites are performed by one's relatives with the right faith, it helps the intelligence of the departed soul, unless the latter is overpoweringly vicious. So we're, we're getting another justification for the practice of religious rites, which again is not really the main concern of the Yoga Vasishta. Let us return to the palace of King Padma. As I said, Leela and Saraswati re-entered that beautiful palace and the room in which the embalmed body of Padma had been kept. All, all the royal attendants were fast asleep. <laughs>